It's Friday, April the 15th, 2022. This is our Good Friday message from Park Street Christian Church in El Dorado Springs, Missouri. The title of tonight's message is, Were You There? I wish I knew what happened in between Matthew chapter 27 and Luke chapter 23. I wish I could tell you about the moment that occurred that changed everything because there was a moment when it did just that. Matthew 27, verse 44 says, The robbers, plural, the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Luke 23, beginning with verse 39, says, One of the criminals who was hanged there hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answer, rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God since we're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. What happened? Well, something happened. Matthew says both criminals were mocking him, Jesus. But Luke says that one of them changed. I wish I knew the moment when this man went from being a mocker of Jesus to a defender of Jesus. There was a moment that touched him. And there is often great power in a singular moment. Some of you know that. You've experienced it for yourself. A moment can change everything. A man gets down on his knee, pulls out a ring, and proposes, and everything changes. A young couple goes to a hospital. It's just the two of them. It's always been just the two of them for three or four years. But they leave two days later, and now it's three of them, and everything changes. Believe me, everything changes. In a moment, a nation can change. I will never forget the day I was sitting at my desk at my office at Central Christian Church in Tampa, Florida, when my secretary, Carol, knocked on the door between our offices and I motioned for her to come in, and she said, you need to turn on your television. Something's going down in New York City. And I said, which, which station? She says, I don't think it will matter. So I turned it on, and I was spellbound, sat there in silence, trying to grasp what was taking place. And then I saw, out of the right side of the screen, uh, another jet airliner come in and crash into the second World Trade Tower. On purpose, obviously. And I thought to myself, this changes everything. And it did. In a moment, the future can change. Your health can change. The doctor's office calls. And the receptionist says, uh, we need for you to come back in if you can get here today. The doctor wants to meet with you and discuss your test results. The results are back. Well, could you just tell me on the phone what... What's going on? I really like to know. No, he wants you to come in. He wants to talk to you about this in person. In a moment like that, everything can change. In a moment, everything can change. A promotion, a pink slip, an earthquake, a tornado, a car accident, a move. For better or worse, every moment of every day carries with it the possibility of changing your life. In a moment, a heart can change. I've been blessed to see that. And that's what happens here in our account in Matthew 27 and Luke 23. A heart changes. A life is changed. This thief began the day mocking Jesus and later defends him. He spent at least six hours with Jesus, probably longer than that, counting any time he would have been around Jesus when Jesus was being scourged. But something happened during that time. I wish I knew exactly what it was. I think it would sure help a lot if we knew a little bit more about this man's background, but we know precious little. We don't even know his name. And there's no reliable history that speaks to this thief's life. Oral tradition doesn't tell us really anything that helps. We don't know if he has any family or friends. That apparently he doesn't. Some of the language and how he speaks to the other thief kind of indicates to me that perhaps they had been partners in crime at least part of the time. We're being punished for what our deeds deserve, he said. But we really don't know 
what his crimes were. We know he's a thief, a robber, but we don't have his rap sheet. Maybe he was this violent criminal who was guilty of some heinous crimes, but maybe not. To be honest, I'd like to think he wasn't that bad of a guy, really. I'd be a lot more comfortable with his story if he was just a guy who'd made, yes, a few bad decisions, but he just never got a break in life. That's one way to think about this man. Maybe he just didn't grow up in a good home. His dad left him when he was an infant. He never knew his dad. His mom had to abandon him to the streets at age seven or so to be a beggar. That was not that unusual at that day. And perhaps on the streets he began as a pretty kind kid. He did steal some bread for himself and for the other children. But eventually he gets caught. He's thrown in jail. And one thing led to another. Through a series of unfortunate events, he finds himself being crucified on a cross next to Jesus of Nazareth. Maybe that's the way his story went. We really just don't know what it was like, what happened. There's something about us that I think would feel more comfortable if that was the explanation for this man's life. No, that's possible because Jesus was always showing love to people who were not bad people. They were just maybe had two strikes against them. I mean, there was a blind man on the side of the road and everybody's telling him to be quiet, but he learns it's Jesus of Nazareth who go, is going by and he's heard about him, no doubt. And he's crying out for Jesus. The crowd's shushing him, trying to get him to be quiet. But Jesus hears him and goes over to him and he heals him. A woman is brought to Jesus who's been caught in a very act of adultery. Everyone has their stones ready to put her to death. Now Jesus sets her free. There's a tax collector sitting in his booth. And the Jewish people hated the tax collectors, especially if they were one of their own who were working for Rome. That was kind of like being a traitor. And this man's name was Matthew. And Jesus goes by and says, Matthew, why don't you leave this and just come be my disciple. Come and follow me. And then there's a prostitute who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And Jesus not only allows it, he commends it. And maybe this event with Jesus on the cross and these thieves, this was God's way of reaching out and righting a wrong one last time through the life of Jesus before his death, of reaching out to somebody who was often unloved and and almost always overlooked. He just never had a break in life. There was something, there's something about a story like that that, that kind of appeals to me. I listened to a sermon about this event, this passage of scripture, a few years ago, and the preacher, at least his theory was that perhaps this man was a Jewish zealot who had fought against the Roman insurgency and occupiers of the Israelites' land. He was a great defender of God's people, and the reason Jesus saved him at the end of his life was because he had done some noble deeds in in God's name. He deserved it. I remember reading uh, the account experience from our Brotherhood of Churches had with the serial killer and cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer while in prison. I remember reading how he befriended him over a period of several months couldn't visit him often, but when he was allowed to, he did, and he built a friendship up with Jeffrey Dahmer, and they began studying scripture together. He led him to Christ. He confessed his sins, confessed his need for Christ, and was immersed in prison. And there was a lot of people, when they found out, didn't see how that could be possible, that he could be forgiven for his heinous acts. And they were awful, awful. There's something about 11th hour pardons that we kind of push back at, you know? We just don't like them very well. We kind of have this, we don't ever say this, but we kind of have this idea, I think, of the faith as Jesus pays the initial membership fee, but the rest of us have to keep pay, paying dues to, in order to get in. Yet everything about this man would indicate that he did absolutely nothing to deserve forgiveness. He was being executed in the vilest way possible. 
<clears throat> it was punishment that was reserved for the worst of all criminals. And so likely his story was that it would be just as heinous as you can imagine. My guess is that he had numerous victims. Perhaps he grew up in a very normal family, and I guess he probably did. And his father tried to teach him the family business, but he got to a certain age and said, I've had enough of this. I don't want this. I'm going to go my own way. And so he hit the streets, and he eventually started taking what he wanted to take and hurting who he wanted to hurt. And along the way, perhaps, gained a reputation for violence. Eventually, it catches up with him. The Romans imprisoned him, and in prison he becomes bitter and angry and hard-hearted as these Roman insurgents holding him captive and now crucifying him in this humiliating way. That's probably closer to the truth about this man's life. This 11th hour, and late in the 11th hour, pardon, comes to a man who did absolutely nothing to deserve this. He had no time to say thank you with his life. All he had time to do was cry out to God. But what was it that caused him to cry out? What was it that caused this transformation for him to go from, from proud, arrogant man who was mocking Jesus to a humble person who defends Jesus and cries out and asks for help? I can't prove it, but I suspect that he'd heard about Jesus before. He'd heard something about this carpenter turned Messiah. King, rabbi, maybe once in a short imprisonment, he had a cellmate who'd been in the crowd the day that Jesus took a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish and fed thousands with it. I don't know. Maybe he used to steal money from that blind man sitting alongside the road, took advantage of him, and he stopped one day, one day to try to do that again, but the man was gone, and he asked somebody nearby, what about the guy who's always sitting here begging? Oh, he's been healed. Jesus of Nazareth restored his sight. He has perfect vision. He's, he's working now. Maybe that's what happened. However, whatever his thoughts were, they were changed on this Friday. He witnessed something. He, he saw something. He heard something. He would have been close enough to hear Jesus. In fact, he was one of the very few people who could have heard all the words of Jesus from the cross. We know he was close enough that the two of them had a conversation. They weren't yelling back and forth. When you're nailed to a crossbeam, outstretched arms, you're gasping for every breath. The majority of people who died in crucifixion died of asphyxiation, and you don't yell, you can't yell, when you're dying of asphyxiation. They were so close enough they could talk to one another, and he would have heard the words of Jesus. So I think it was something that Jesus said that changed him, that touched him. He would have heard Jesus cry out to his heavenly Father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would have heard that. Maybe that was what touched him. Well, certainly there was something about the way Jesus spoke to God that made someone think he really is the Son of God. After all, a centurion came to that conclusion. Maybe that's what happened. This thief cries out to God because of what he heard Jesus saying to God. But when Jesus cries out to God, he, he says, Why have you forsaken me? And he's almost quoting word for word from Psalm 22. And in Psalm 22, you can read about pierced feet, pierced hands. And that was written roughly a thousand years before this took place, long before crucifixion had even been invented. We have no record of crucifixions, even close to the period of Jesus. I mean, prior to Jesus' death, within 800 or 1,000 years. But these are the words that Jesus is quoting. Was he just quoting random Old Testament scripture, or did he mean it? Did he say this intentionally, that God had abandoned him? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God cannot live in fellowship, in relationship with sin. That's the whole reason Jesus came. So when he became sin for mankind, for this rebel, for me, for you, God had to turn away. Others, though, explain it differently because there is something unsettling about this idea of God abandoning Jesus. But when Jesus became sin, he was separated from God so that we could be united to God. If you think about it, that changes everything. 
I don't know if that was the moment that touched the sleeve and changed his life. I don't think he could have understood the theological implications of what was happening at that moment. So I don't know if that was the moment when he got it, when he understood. Maybe the moment was when he was Jesus on the cross and he addressed his mother. During his most excruciating pain, he looks down, pain that only this thief could identify with, perhaps. He looks at his mother and says, Dear woman, it's a term of affection. It's like saying, ma'am. It's, it's, it's a term of respect. Dear woman, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. He was speaking, of course, to his mother Mary, and he was addressing the disciple that he loved, John. You see, Jesus, of course, the oldest of his family, his siblings, and when his stepfather Joseph died, we don't know what happened. He's out of the picture. We know that. The duty fell to Jesus as the oldest boy, oldest son, to provide for and protect his own mother. So in his dying moments, when he's a complete victim here, he's thinking of other people. He's thinking of his mother. When he's in excruciating pain and he dresses his mom, he's concerned about her. How could that not touch your heart if you were listening? Maybe that's what it was. Maybe that was the moment this thief's heart was melted. But as I, as I think through the different scenes that unfold at the cross, I think that the one that perhaps has changed everything and made the difference between Matthew 27 and Luke 23 that really made the difference to this thief was when he heard Jesus pray for his executioners and those who were responsible for his crucifixion. Now, I would have prayed for their destruction, okay? I got 10,000 angels at my disposal. I am calling them down. I would have prayed for that. But Jesus did not. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. What do you do with that kind of grace? I think that was it. You see, this thief understood what these soldiers had done to Jesus. He understood it as well as anyone. When Jesus went through a scourging, the scourging he did, where his hands are tied, his arms are wrapped around a post, or where his back is stretched taunt, and the Roman soldiers would come and whip him with the cat of nine tails, and when they whipped Jesus, when they whipped the thieves, we often think of, well, they, they stopped at 39 lashes. That would be plenty. One would be enough. Well, that was true for the Jews. They normally scourged people with fewer blows than others like the Romans, but the Jews were not the ones administering this punishment, the scourging. It was the Romans. They didn't keep count. They were simply experts at whipping a man, scourging a man to within an inch of the end of his life. And sometimes they went past it. But they didn't use just a regular whip that would inflict welts. That would be severe enough. And people died from that. I understand that. But they used a whip with bits of glass and bits of bone and lead balls that were woven into the straps of the whip. And they didn't just whip the back. To make it swell up, but they would wrap it around the back and the chest or the neck or the shoulders, the upper arms, and rip it, exposing muscle and tissue and oftentimes vertebrae. Historians tell us that sometimes that up to six out of ten men who were scourged died from that. Well, this thief experienced that too. And from there, they would be put on the, the patibulum, would be laid across their shoulders against the back of their neck. That was ripped raw. And the patibulum horizontal beam of the cross weighed in the neighborhood of 120 to 125 pounds, typically, what I've seen, what I've read. And then they would begin this very, very difficult walk up to, to the place of punishment. And in this case, of course, we know it was Golgotha. And when they got there, the patellum of the cross would be taken and nailed to the vertical beam of the cross, and they would stretch out the arms and nail them to the beam. Now, you've probably heard before in 
thought in your mind how hard it would be to suspend somebody by nailing through the palms of their hands. Well, that probably wasn't where they were pierced. It was probably in the uh, wrist, the base of the hand. There is the thernal furrow that when the thumb is folded over forms a thicker part of the hand where sometimes a spike can be driven through that and I read that it was able to support up to 88 pounds per hand per arm that way so that would work for a while but we have to understand that that most of the time people who were crucified eventually the body would have convulsions and so that probably would not endure the process of being nailed to the cross beam even through the thenar furrow um, but there's another reason that the likely place was through the place at the base of the hand was because of there it would sever the median nerve and that would shoot excruciating pain from the arm all the way up to the spine. And then, of course, the soldiers took the, the feet and put one foot on top of the other and a long spike was drove through both feet into the vertical beam. This man was with Jesus. That's what happened to him. That's what happened to Jesus. Same thing. I saw some results of an archaeologist excavation of somebody who had been crucified and the wood was olive wood that was used in this particular crucifixion, at least the, the um, upright, the vertical beam. And it's very, very hard wood. And the, the spike that was used was about, was not as quite as big as a railroad tie spike, but it was a lot bigger than a 16-penny nail, like three, at least three times the diameter of a 16-penny spike. And it was driven through the ankle, which was part of the ankle bone was still attached to this piece of wood because piercing the ankle then into that olive wood, it was so hard it bent the spike and they couldn't pry it back out. They tried to recycle their spikes and pull it out of the crucified victim's arms, hands, and, and legs once they were dead so they could use them again. But apparently this time they couldn't because it was bent and they couldn't pull it out. But that was discovered through excavation. But on the cross, I'm telling you, this criminal felt rage. He felt anger. These are not his own people. These are the Romans who have occupied, took control of their land. And now they look at what they've done to him. And then he hears Jesus, after all this, say, Father, forgive them. What do you do with that kind of grace? I think that wrecked this thief's life. It just wrecked him. His heart finally is softened in that moment. Who is this who speaks forgiveness to his executioners? That doesn't happen. Maybe this man didn't really deserve what he was going through. Maybe he really was the promised one. Maybe he, maybe he is the Messiah. And his thief's heart is changed. Now, I wonder if he didn't say to himself, if he can forgive these people who've done this to him, maybe... Maybe he can forgive me. Maybe he can forgive me. And so this thief did something that Peter hid from, that all the rest of the disciples ran from, and that Pilate tried to wash his hands of. He defends Jesus. And when Jesus was most alone, when he felt completely abandoned even by his heavenly father, a common criminal, and perhaps the most perfect picture of the whole reason Jesus came to earth to begin with, comes to his defense. The thief on the other side of Jesus says more mocking words, insults, and ridicules Jesus. And this thief says, you and I are getting what we deserve for what we've done. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. What is he saying? He's saying, I, I'm i wrong. I have sinned. I've fallen short. I deserve this. And as his life ebbs away, he has this moment. Finally, and he gets it. He finally gets it and he confesses that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, the promised king. And he turns to Jesus, Jesus, the saving king. He says, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? 
And Jesus said today, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now I can't say for sure that this was what, how it went down, what the moment was, but there was a moment that touched him and changed him. I've had one of those. I've had a moment like that. Have you? When grace just wrecked your life and you knew that you would never be the same again. Remember the old song, Were You There? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? And I sometimes have wondered over the years what it would have been like to have been there. I guess of all the people at the crucifixion scene, the one that I feel the most in common with is this thief who was crucified next to Jesus because just like him, I have done nothing to deserve salvation. It's been given to me as a free gift from God. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? I was there. I've been there. Because, you know, like the thief, I had a moment when I recognized my sin and my trespasses, my iniquity, my mistakes. The Bible says that all of us have fallen short of God's glory. In other words, there is a standard out there that not one single human being has ever lived up to. But what happens most of the time, predominantly, instead of coming clean, instead of owning up to our sins, having a moment where we acknowledge it, we tend to do the opposite. We blame other people. It's not my fault. It's the home I grew up in. It's my parents' fault. It's my spouse's fault. It's, it's the culture's fault. It's not me. Instead of coming clean and owning it, we often rationalize our sin. What I did was not that big of a deal, you know? And we compare ourselves to other people. We say, hey, well, yeah, I've messed up some, okay? I know that. But have you been? Have you ever seen entertainment tonight and seen what those people are doing? I'm doing fine. God grades on the curve. No, he doesn't grade on the curve. It's like if you're driving on an interstate and you drift along and you look down your you're running 75 and 70 mile an hour speed limit zone on the interstate. You don't feel too bad about that because there are people who are passing you 80, 85 or so. And so by that standard, you're not a bad offender. But that's not the way God operates. We tend to distract ourselves from our the seriousness of our own sin. And we just tie ourselves up with work and with hobbies and distractions diversions in life we just don't have very many moments when we're honest and we look deep down inside of where we really live and we own it the thief does that in the waning moments of his life he knows he's about to die he recognizes his own sin but another thing he does in doing that is he understands that he deserves death and that's what I deserve. My sins condemn me. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You need to understand. Make no doubt about that. That is exactly what I deserve. Eternal condemnation, eternal punishment, separation from God. That's what I have coming. Like this thief, I've come to understand, though, that I can't save myself. It doesn't matter what I do or how hard I work. There is just no way that I can save myself. Years ago when I was in high school in a biology class, it was a tough semester and we knew the final was going to be a beast. And I liked biology and so I had studied a bit more for this class than some because I knew it was going to be a challenging final and I wanted to learn it. But we got to the end of the semester, the day of the dreaded final arrived, and we walked into our classroom. And the teacher, Bob, said, take your test, lay it face down on your desk, do not look at any of it, and lay it, leave it laying there until I tell you what to do. So we all passed the test around, laid it face down on our desk, and waited. He said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to read entirely through the, the whole test. All of it, every page, do not pick up your pencil. Don't answer any of the questions. Just read through it. I'll be back in about 45 minutes towards the end of the class period. And so, he walked out. We turned our papers over. We began to read. 
and I read and I realized even though I had studied quite a bit I had not studied enough and I was in trouble but at the last page the last paragraph trying to teach us something about God's grace he had written or it was printed there you can try to get an A today by taking this test or you can simply write your name on the appropriate spot on the cover sheet walk to the front lay it face down on the wire basket and wire basket on my desk and walk out and you'll automatically get an A it didn't take me long to write my name on there walk to the front lay it face down his wire basket walk out of that room and I didn't look back but there was a classmate of mine that I understand did not read it all the way through apparently and Patrick should have because that was probably the only A he was going to get that semester in any class. And then there was Phyllis, the class brain, who um, was really kind of upset. And she said, what kind of a teacher, I think her words were later that I found out, what kind of a teacher gives an A for nothing? And she stayed, she took the test on principle. If she got an A, and I'm sure she did, she was going to earn it. And I really understand that. I mean, I, I guess, I, you know, it makes sense. Even though I'm dying in my sins, there's a part of me that says, I don't need any help from you. I don't need any help from anyone. I can be like the other thief on the other side of Jesus. My sins have nailed me to the cross, and the consequences are overwhelming. And I can still, at times, refuse to cry out for help. I can be like that. I really resonate with this thief. I was there because like him, I've had this moment where I received the promise of eternal life because the Bible doesn't just say the wages of sin is death. It goes on to say, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Jesus tells this thief, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. And the absolute worst day of this man's life was now the best day of his life, bar none. The worst thing that could ever happen to any person being crucified became the best thing that could have ever happened to him. And so one day in heaven, I'm going to find out. I'm going to try my best to track him down, and I'm going to ask him, what was that moment? What was that moment for you when you saw, when you understood, when you got it? Because I, I've had a moment like that myself, and I'll tell you about mine, but I want to hear about yours first. That's really what we hope accomplished is accomplished through a good Friday service and service and, and sermon is that we understand in a greater way, perhaps, what Jesus did for us and for everyone. When God's grace was demonstrated so vividly that it wrecked our lives and where God changed everything. So I hope that you will take a few moments whenever you see this and you'll meditate on the grace and goodness of God who redeemed you from all your sin and has the gift of eternal life for you.